Once again today we're coming to your place of listening from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. You're hoping the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to many hundreds out in the radio listen audience as well as you here in the auditorium. We welcome you here. We welcome you out there. And you in the radio listen audience should do someone a favor. If you'd call them especially a shut-in and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. I'm going to speak today on the subject, will we know each other in heaven? If so, how? Will we know each other in heaven? That'll be my subject today. And call your friends and tell them about it. And we give them what thus saith the Lord God in this respect. And the music, the singing, the message will be on cassette tape number 289. If you'd like to have it, you can write in and request it by number or you request it by title. I'll be speaking on the subject where we know each other in heaven. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's one thing you notice that's outstanding in the fundamental independent missionary Baptist church is people bring their Bibles to church. I'm glad to see so many of you doing that. And many of you have the original Schofield Reference Bible. That's the one I recommend. I've used it since I've been saved, since I've been in the ministry. It's used by most fundamental believers over the nation. And it's a great reference Bible. And uh, you'll always find the same chapter on the same page whenever you change and get a new one. Keep that in mind. So when you get used to it, then of course when you get a new Bible, uh, where the old one out, you can always find John 3.16, the same place in the Bible. You know about where it is. So you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for the reading of God's Word today. I do have a few Schofield reference Bibles in my study. I could save you anywhere from 10 to 12, maybe $15 on those Bibles. And as I've said many times, I'm not in the Bible selling business, but I accumulate some along that I might have them for you or you in the radio listening audience would like to have it. Now, when you have the Schofield reference, of course, when I give you the page number, you can always turn there and find the chapter very quickly and follow me as I read the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bath all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Let me pause there and make a comment. I was reading in, I believe, the Atlanta paper last week where the Catholics and the Pentecostals are really courting each other and getting together and agreeing with each other and all of them trying to speak in tongues. Now that's the ecumenical movement. That's the building of the one world church. The Antichrist will take over when the true church is lifted. It'd be good if they'd read the Bible and find that tongues have ceased. Tongues ceased back whenever God gave the complete Bible and the apostles passed off the scene. There's been no more biblical tongues since then. All this unknown or other tongues movement you have today, it's not of God. It's not based on the Bible. It's of man and not of the Lord. And many times in these cultures of Satan, you need to realize that. Tongues have ceased. They ceased many years ago. Don't have any biblical tongues today. No, sir, not at all. And you'd do well to read your Bible and find that out. Now it says in verse 9, For you know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, 
I put away childish things. For now we see through at last darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And now about his faith, hope, and charity, these three, but greatest of these is charity. Now my text is found in verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. Will we know each other in heaven? This question has been in the minds of a lot of people. Will we know each other in heaven? The answer is yes. Then we're going to know as we are known. There's a great preacher one time by the name of John Evans. He said to his wife, she asked him that question. Do you think we will be bigger fools in heaven than we are down here? The answer, of course, is no. We're going to know better over there. Know as we are known. I'm going to give you some instances in the Bible that prove to us without a shadow of a doubt that you'll very easily know each other in heaven. Number one, David said when his child died in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23, but now he is dead, I shall go to him. David said, I'm going to my child. Now, if David had known that he would not have known his child, he wouldn't have made that statement. And he knew he would know his child when he went to heaven. He says, I can't bring him back, but I will go to him. So you can't bring your loved ones back and you can go to them. Now, if you didn't know them, then that would not be of importance. But you do know, will know them and you'll know them far better over there than you knew them down here. Now, many of you people that have children and loved ones, you've known them quite well. You've been together many years. And wives and husbands pretty well understand each other. But you know, when you get on the other side, you're going to know one another even better than you know each other down here. Isn't that something? And then we find the second expression, the expression gathered to his people. In Genesis chapter 25 and verse 8, then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people, gathered to his loved ones on the other side. Now, had he not known them, that would be of no importance. Now, when you die as a Christian, you're gathered to your people. All of your loved ones is already gone on. They're over there. They're waiting for you to come. And when you die, you're going to be gathered with them as one big family on the other side. And you recognize them immediately. And they'll recognize you immediately. The very moment you enter into heaven, you'll see them, you'll recognize them, and they will recognize you immediately. No doubt about that. The Bible said Abraham was gathered unto his people. Number three, Jacob said he would go to Joseph. Now in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 35, and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now here Jacob thought Joseph had been destroyed by a wild beast. And he said, I will go down unto the grave unto my son. He said, I'm going to my son. He thought he had been destroyed. He died, been killed by this wild beast. He said, I'm going to my son. This is going to bring my gray hair down to the grave. And when it does, I'm going to my son. And likewise, if you have a son in heaven, that's the day coming when you'll be going to your son. And you must remember that. And Jacob said, I'm going to him. He is a young man, young lad. I loved him. And uh, he thought he was dead. He said, I'm going to him. And we, he said, I'm going to die soon because this is breaking my heart. I can't take too much more. And I'll soon be going to join Joseph. Now, if he hadn't known Joseph on the other side, there'd been no real joy in looking forward to joining him on the other side. Then we come to thought number four, and that is Saul was recognized by Samuel. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 14 and 15, when the witch of Endor brought up Samuel, it said that he said unto her, What form is he? And she said, An old man coming up, and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived it was Samuel, 
And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Now here we find that Saul recognized the old prophet Samuel. Samuel already died and gone on to be with God. But here he comes back on this special occasion. And there we find that Saul recognizes Samuel. Will we know each other in heaven? To be sure we will. There we'll know even as we are known. And the Bible said, God knows the number of every hair in our head. The average man has about 24,000 hairs on top of his head. God has them all numbered. He knows all about them. And one of these days, one of these days when you get to heaven, you'll know even as you'll know them. Number five, Peter, James, and John recognized Moses and Elijah on uh, the mounting of transfiguration. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now Moses and Elijah had gone on to be with God many years prior to this time because uh, we find that Peter, James, and John had never laid eyes on them. They had never seen uh, Moses and Elijah. They read about them. They heard about them. And they heard uh, Old Testament preachers, no doubt, uh, prophets preach about them. But they had never seen Moses and they had never seen Elijah. And Jesus said, we go up on the mountain of transfiguration. And they went up on this mountain, on Mount Tabor. And there upon that mountain, while they were there, Jesus transfigured before them. And there came Moses and Elijah on top of that mountain. I've been there at this particular place where tradition tells us that uh, Jesus was um, transfigured there on uh, this mountain. I've been there and I've seen the place. They have a building built there, tabernacle. Because Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and so forth and so on. But, beloved, they saw Moses and Elijah, and immediately they recognized them. Now, Jesus did not say, now, Peter, I want to introduce James, you, you and John and James to two men you have read about in Old Testament days. He didn't say that. Now, the very moment that these apostles saw Elijah, they recognized him. The very moment they saw Moses, they recognized him. Now, when you get to heaven, you won't have to say, I want you to introduce me to this man and tell me who this fellow is. When you get to heaven, the very moment you lay eyes on Moses, you're going to say, hello, Moses. Whenever you lay eyes on Elijah, you're going to say, that's Elijah. When you lay eyes on Daniel, you're going to say, that's old Daniel. And you're going to know everybody in heaven and nobody will be introduced to you because you'll know as you are known. Now, beloved, we know, we'll be know as we're known, the Bible tells us, and God knows us better than we know ourselves, of course, and we're going to know as we're known by God on the other side. And then number six, we find Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob recognized in the kingdom of God with all the prophets. The Bible says in Luke chapter 13 and verse 28, And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and ye you yourselves thrust out. He's saying here, these people that reject God, when they see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, they themselves will be cast out into outer darkness. They'll recognize Abraham. They'll recognize Isaac. They'll recognize Jacob. Now, Abraham represents here the Old Testament saints. We find that um, uh, Isaac represents the New Testament saints, and Jacob represents the tribulation saints. And they'll be recognized the moment you lay eyes on them, the Bible said these are casting out of darkness will recognize them when they see them. So we'll know as we're known, and we'll most certainly know each other in heaven. We don't have to be introduced to anyone. You have grandparents, great-grandparents and, and that you've never seen. I had a great-granddaddy who was a great a worker in the church. At one time, till the soil here where this church is. His name was Elp Edwards. Never saw him. Saw my granddaddy. Never saw him. I saw my great-grandmother. And I understand he was a great man of God and served faithfully in his church in serving God. When I cross on the other side and see my great-grandfather, Elp Edwards, 
I'm not, somebody's not going to say, oh, Virgil, I want to come introduce you to your great grandfather. I'll know him immediately. I'll recognize him the moment I lay eyes on him. And that ought to be encouraging to every one of you. Whenever you get to heaven, you'll know as you're known. Then we come to thought number seven, and that is Mary Magdalene recognize Jesus by his voice. In John chapter 20 and verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and says unto him, Reboni I, which is to say, Master. Now Jesus was there in the garden, and Mary was there weeping because she found not the body of Jesus. He'd already risen from the dead, and she thought she heard the gardener, the man that kept the garden, walking there in the garden. She paid it no attention. She was filled with sorrow and weeping because she couldn't find Jesus. His body had risen from the dead. And while she was weeping and in sorrow, then Jesus spoke to her. Jesus said, Mary. And the moment he said, Mary, she didn't have to turn and look to see him. She recognized him by that voice. And I believe with all my heart that's going to be a recognition also by our voices in heaven. Now you may say, Preacher Edwards, I don't like the sound of my voice. Now God's going to correct all voices and everybody's going to have a beautiful voice in heaven. And who knows, Preacher Edwards might be able to sing over there. You can't ever tell. I might have a voice to sing. But God will straighten out all the, the kinks and the, and the grunts and the groans and the whistles and the sounds in our voices and the cracks and so forth. When we get to heaven, we'll have a perfect voice. But there'll be a certain sound of that voice that when I speak, then you recognize me. When you speak, I recognize you. I can go places today. I've been on the radio here in Athens now in my 39th year. I've many times gone into places where people had a symbol for various reasons in the stores and just uh, maybe uh, speak and say a few words to somebody and you'd be surprised. People turn and look. Now they recognize my voice. And uh, they, because they've been heard so many times on the radio and they recognized immediately. Now, when we get to heaven, it'll be the same way. Now, anything that might not sound too good in our voices will be corrected. I believe that, but I believe there'll be a certain something about our voice when we get there that we had down here that'll help us even to recognize each other by sound. And so she recognized the voice of Jesus and he had come back and he was in his uh, glorified body, of course. And she recognized that voice and he had the same voice, the same sound that he had before he was crucified. See, Jesus, after he was crucified and came back from the dead, he had the same voice he had before he was crucified. That ought to tell us something. Then we come to thought number eight, and that is the disciples knew Jesus after his resurrection. Nobody had to say, I want to introduce you to a man that you might not remember. They knew him after his resurrection. The Bible says in John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, Then the same dead evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, then the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, Jesus didn't say, now you won't know me, and I got to tell you who I am. I uh, just, he came in their midst, and of course, they saw the scars in his hands and the scar in his side. He showed them that for a reason. But they recognized the Son of God. They knew him. They recognized him there when he met them on this particular a time when they met there in this room. He just came right in, didn't have to open the door. He just happened up right there in their presence. Now think about that. Now when you get that glorified body, you won't have to open the door. You can just happen up wherever you want to. You can be in one place and said like to be in another, and you can be there. That's the kind of body Jesus had, and you're going to have a body like unto the Lord's. The Bible said when you see him, you'll be like him because you'll see him as he is. Then we come to thought number nine, and that is Dives, the rich man, in Luke chapter 16, knew Abraham and Lazarus. 
The Bible says in verse 23, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and said, Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now here's a man, a rich man, that knew Lazarus on the earth. He was a poor old emaciated, starved to death, sick man filled with sores on the earth, and the rich man knew him. He didn't think as much of him as he did his dogs and gave him nothing to eat to help him out. He only got the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table that the dogs ate. And so old Dives looked across that great gulf, and what do you think he saw? He saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, and he recognized Lazarus. Now, Lazarus didn't have that old emaciated body at that time. Beloved, Lazarus had a different kind of body at that time. He had a soulless body, and he saw him in that body and recognized him. And then Dives also recognized Abraham. Now, he saw Abraham. He recognized Abraham and called him Father Abraham. And so he recognized him. We come to thought number 10, that is Jesus implied the thief would know him in paradise. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now why would Jesus make that statement if Jesus knew the thief wouldn't know him? See, this thief got saved. God saved him there on the cross. And that very day, he went with Jesus down into paradise. At that time, paradise was in the heart of the earth. And they went down into paradise. And there'd been no point in Jesus saying to this poor thief that you're going to be with me today in paradise. If Jesus had known, he would not have been recognized by that thief. He recognized Jesus just as much down there in the paradise as he did when he was on the cross. And so he knew it. And beloved, it'll be the same way when we get to heaven. When you see Jesus, nobody's going to have to say, I want to introduce you to the Lamb of God. I want to point out the Savior and let you tell you who he is and so you know him. No, the very moment you lay eyes on Jesus, you'll recognize him. You recognize him above everything and everybody, I'm sure of that. Because he'll be the Son of God, the light of heaven, and you'll recognize him. We come to thought number uh, 11, and that is Stephen's new Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, nobody had to say, now, Stevens, I want to introduce you to somebody standing at the right hand of God. The moment that heaven opened and Jesus stood to his feet at the right hand of God the Father, then uh, Stevens recognized him. He recognized Jesus immediately standing at the right hand of God. And so when you enter into heaven, the first one that you're really going to recognize will be Jesus. Then I believe your loved ones and friends, you're going to recognize them and the prophets of God. And Stephen's recognized Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Yes, we'll know each other in heaven. Then the Bible tells us, number 12, we shall know then as we are known. Getting back to my text. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. Now you see through a glass darkly. When I was a little boy growing up and we had the eclipse of the sun coming up, we were told not to look directly into the sun. You still have that advice today. You warned about doing that. But we were told if we had take a piece of glass and smut that glass, then we could look through that smutted glass and look at the sun. And that we did. There we looked through a glass darkly. We put smut on it. Some of you have done that. Some of you out in the radio listening audience can say, Preach Edwards, I did that when I was a boy growing up out on the farm or someplace. You look through that glass darkly. But beloved, when we get to heaven, it's going to be different. It won't be like looking through a dark glass. That's the kind of way we see things today and see each other today is through a dark glass. 
We can't see or know all things, but when we get there, all the smut, as it were, will be wiped off the glass. It'll be perfectly clear, and you can see through the glass without any interference whatsoever. Won't that be wonderful? The Bible said, then we're going to know as we are known. Heaven is a wonderful place. People are dying every day and going to hell. It's awful the way people are being killed and in car wrecks and, and committing suicide and people getting on dope and alcohol, destroying their bodies and these terrible plagues and diseases and the hot weather killing multitudes of people. Just two people died last week, elderly people that I knew about died on yesterday, I believe. Now, beloved, listen, we need to realize we're moving toward the end. And we're facing many things down here that can hasten that end, and we need to be ready. Now, if you miss heaven, you have missed it. This earth is a garbage can compared to heaven. Heaven is such a wonderful place until God didn't tell us too much about it. And the reason God didn't say too much about heaven is because he did not want us to get homesick and want to go before our time. I believe that's one reason. And I believe that's why God said to Paul, when Paul was caught up into the third heaven, God said, now, Paul, you go back down to the earth and finish your ministry, son. But don't you open your mouth about what you saw up here. Don't you tell a living soul about what you saw up here in heaven. You keep that a secret. And I believe with all of my heart that every day Paul said, I hope today's the day. I trust today's the day and I can go back up there. Oh, it's such a wonderful place. And Paul looked forward. He said, I desire to go and be with the Lord and depart and be with him. It'd be far better for me if I could just go on. I can hardly wait. But he says, it's better for you. I stay down here and finish my ministry. And God said, Paul, don't go back down there talking about what you saw. You may say, preacher, why did God tell him not to do that? God didn't want us to get too homesick down here and want to go to heaven before our time. And so God hid a lot of things from us so that we wouldn't want to rush on in until God got through with us. And God hid something else from us, and it's God's grace that did it. God did not tell us the time that we had died. God didn't tell you how long you'd live on the earth, how long you'd be here when you're going to die. God didn't tell you that. He didn't tell me. That's the goodness and the grace of God that God didn't tell us. And so God wants us to serve him day by day, not knowing the moment he's going to call us in. There was a man one time, uh, a soldier rather, that was on a train during World War II, and he had been three years in the Pacific. And he could hardly wait to get home. He's on this train. He's headed to Chicago. And about 100 miles away from Chicago, he said to the porter, he said, how far are we away? He said, about 100 miles. He said, how fast are we going? The porter said, we're on level ground. I surmise we're traveling about 105 miles an hour. That boy said, let me get my duffel bag. He had a big smile on his face. He reached up and got his duffel bag. He said, I'm going to be the first one off of this train. I'm getting off the moment she stops. I'll have my duffel bag ready. I haven't been home in three years. I spent three years in the Pacific, and I got a chance to go back home. I'll be the first one off. You know why he said that? He knew his mother. He knew his daddy. He knew his brothers and sisters, and he knew his sweetheart. Be waiting there to depot for him whenever he arrived on the scene, and he was going to be the first one off. Oh, beloved, we should feel that way about heaven. We should feel like, well, we need want to get in there as quick as we can. As soon as God gets through with us, because heaven is a wonderful place. There's a man dying one time. His son came around and said, Dad, said, uh, how is it in the valley? I see you about to die. And how is it in the valley down there? His daddy said, son, said there's no valleys here. He said, the most beautiful and bright mountains I've ever laid miles on. He said, son, it's no valley, but a beautiful mountain. He closed his eyes and went home to be with God. Dear people, if you miss heaven, you have missed it. And you don't have to go to hell, but that's exactly where you go. And if you die without Jesus Christ, I don't care who you are. And God's provided a way for you to escape hell and go to heaven. 
And that is through Jesus Christ. And if you are not saved, you ought to right now repent and turn to God. Believe on Him with all your heart and let God save your never dying soul. I hope you will. Because tomorrow could be too late. It's pointed to men once to die. And after that, the judgment. And it's up to you. God will not save you against your will. God lets you go and die and go to hell before he'll force you to accept Christ. But God said, him that comes to me out in no wise cast out. So God will save you if you really want to be saved. So I hope somebody will come to know the Lord today. Let us all stand to our feet. We'll bow our heads for prayer. One of the ladies come on to the organ, would you please? Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, our precious Savior. We pray, dear God, that you'll use the message that you stir our hearts. God, we're so thankful for heaven, and we're so glad that we'll recognize each other, know each other, and see our loved ones again on the other side. Thank you for that hope. Without that hope, we'd be all people most miserable. Have your way in the invitation, I pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Now, while Tracy plays the stanza so on the organ, if you're in this building and you want to get saved, you want to come back to God, you want to unite with this church, you want to come to the front for any reason, God's prompt you to come. Would you come while she plays? Come on right now while we wait. No better time would you find. You need a good church home. Like Northside, a good fundamental Bible-believing church that believes this book, preacher that preaches the book, people that love God. You need a church home like that. If you don't have a church home, think about Northside. Maybe just the place God wants you. Why we wait? If you want to come from another church, we accept you by statement or Notify the church that you've joined Northside or however. We take care of that. You don't have to worry about it. Waiting for you. God is moving. 